DesignCon is great, a great conference, great people. It's great to come once a year and meet in friends. And certainly, every single time I leave DesignCon, I feel invigorated, right, with a bunch of new ideas and things. It's a great place, you know, for people to like join and, you know, learn from each other. That's the most important thing. Yeah, so, you know, I presented the paper this morning and it was more about like some of the pitfalls, you know, when you take some of these measurements and, you know, some of the things that are not obvious after you take the measurements, but after a bunch of post-processing you can observe, right? So hopefully, right, people have learned something, you know, and, you know, uh, take better measurements in the future, right? That's the whole idea. Right, I mean, uh, different aspects of that, right? I mean, sometimes we look at losses, uh, particularly at very high frequency, right? Uh, that's one of the limiting factors, right? Uh, to be able, you know, to accomplish transmission from driver to receiver, right? Other times we're trying, you know, to characterize materials, right? And precise measurements of these uh, traces, right? Allows to get you good material characterization. So if you do wrong, you're gonna be simulating with the wrong values and hence uh, you won't be able, you know, to properly simulate your channels and, you know, could lead to problems, you know, in the, in the real operation of the channel. So I think it's very important, you know, to measure properly uh, because that's the way that you gain understanding, right? By measuring, simulating and, correlate, and correlating, right? Uh, and particularly at high frequencies, right? This is extremely important uh, to be able, you know, to accomplish uh, high data rates. So, you know, there are a bunch of different ways that we've characterized materials over uh, the past years, right? But basically the, the parameters, let's start with the parameters, you know, that we should characterize, every single integrity engineer should characterize are basically like the dielectric material properties, dielectric uh, loss tangent versus frequency, right? Copper uh, uh, losses, right? Uh, skin effect, DC losses and all those things, right? Uh, cross sections of the board, you know, to get a, a, an idea of like the the stack ups, right? And all those things are gonna basically be the number one uh, factor, right? For the losses of your transmission lines, right? And very important for simulations in terms of causality, passivity, and things like that, right? I mean, many people know how to do these characterizations, but also, you know, when you have good models, you can use them as a black box, right? So no, not everybody needs to definitely know all the ins and outs, right? Sure. Uh, the way that we like to characterize materials rather than characterize just like the dielectrics, right? We want to characterize the press stack such we can see everything together, right? And that's why rather than uh, characterizing every element individually, we characterize and we measure the transmission line as it's supposed to be. And that's kind of like a probably like a little bit of the difference, right? Right, so you have like the coupling between the differential pair, right? Yeah. And the coupling is, uh, you know, on a differential pair is rather low as compared, for example, like the twin axe, right? I mean, it's like in the 5%, you know, range, 3 to 5% range, right? The big thing is like how do you minimize the coupling to different differential pairs, right? And how do you control the impedances within the differential pair, right? And that's kind of like where you need to look at the stack up and you need to look at all the variables in your design, you know? Uh, because, you know, some people uh, like to do like uh, loosely coupled uh, differential pairs. Some people prefer uh, tightly coupled differential pairs, uh, uh, basically claiming, right, like tightly coupling differential pairs will have less amount of crosstalk to a different differential pair. But, you know, that has to be uh, looked at the same time of impedance, right? Because the moment that you put your two transmission lines closer together, right, you know, your impedance will go down, right? So if you want your impedance to come up, you have to lift the planes. The moment you start lifting the planes, right, now you have more crosstalk to your, uh, your differential pair. So there is always kind of like a sweet spot, right, that you have to analyze. And in order to analyze crosstalk, you can not only do it, right, just by looking at the crosstalk. You have to look at your whole channel, right? You have to look at the losses, right? Perhaps you have a situation where you need uh, to tightly pack a lot of uh, differential lines, right? And by doing that, you can shorter your length, right? By like two or three inches, you know? So in which case, it might be okay, right? To sustain a little bit more crosstalk because, you know, you are reducing your length, right? So it's, you know, the crosstalk and the stack up it has to be seen in my opinion, right? More in, as a holistic view, you know, of the whole uh, loss uh, margins that you have in your, in your design. Right? I would say like somewhere in between is kind of like a good 
a good compromise solution, right? It's really a ratio of the separation between the differential pairs with respect to the separation to the planes, right? So that's kind of like the ratio that you have to be looking at, right? I mean, you will see sometimes, you know, people cannot have too many layers in the board, right? And they have asymmetrical stack-ups where they put like the differential traces really close to one plane and the other plane really far away because sometimes they have to cross and split or things like that, right? So it's really like the ratio to the closest plane, right? Uh, because you can imagine as two impedances in parallel, right? From the bottom plane and to the top plane, right? Yeah. So that's, that's the problem, right? When you go from one layer to the next, you, have, you need a via, right? I mean, unfortunately, you need a via, right? Uh, and really what, you know, the way that I think about this, I think about like the return currents more than anything, right? So I need, I want to make sure like my return currents, you know, have like a uniform path to come back, right? So, you know, if you can go from one layer to the next, sharing one of the ground planes, for example, from SIG-3 to SIG-5 being SIG-4 like the plane, right? Now, you know, even though you're crossing, right, you're still using like at least one of the references don't change, right? So you facilitate, right, your currents, you know, to return, right? Oftentimes you cannot do that, right? So you have to go deeper into the board or, you know, cross many, many different layers in which case we try to put vias, right, to like allow the current to come back. The reality is like this via uh, have two functions, really. Function number one helps you control the impedance of the transition, right, which is very important, right, uh, because ideally if you have, let's say, like a 50 ohm or a 100 ohm environment, right, you want to control your trace all the way through so that you have 100 ohms, right. That's, uh, and by putting ground vias, right, you, are, you allow for that to happen, right? Uh, and the second reason is to uh, shield for interference from other circuits, okay? We've seen problems where lower frequency circuits, right, uh, gets into our differential pairs. Ha having a ground via right next to the differential pair would completely reduce the amount of crosstalk coming from mid-frequency signals. You know, we see that with like power supplies, for example. You know, sometimes it's not easy to put ground vias everywhere, right? And the way that we like to put ground vias is on the outside of the differential pair, because really, when you look at this differential signal, right, most of the energy is contained between the differential pair, right? And that signal kind of like goes nicely. One of the signals is the reference on the other. The problem is like the common mode signals. The common mode signals tend to spread away, right? And that's what is cross-talking other signals. By putting ground vias outside where the common mode will go, you are catching those currents, right? And you are improving the isolation to our differential pairs or crosstalk to other circuits. So there are two things for the vias, right? One of the things for the via, as I mentioned, is the impedance of the via, right? And the other thing is like the stab of the via, right? I mean, sometimes when you are doing like a economical designs, you don't want to back drill your bores, right? I mean, so the stab will generate like a big dip, which is a quarter resonance of that stab, right? So the longer that stab is, the lower the frequency of the resonance it is, right? So you want to make sure you try to minimize that for higher frequencies, right? Now, uh, that's a, 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 a first order effect type of a situation, right? Like a little bit of a second order effect that you will see very clearly on the S parameters is the impedance of the via itself, right? Uh, you will see like on the S parameters when the impedance of the via changes, right? You will see like very flat profile and then going into the dip or you will see as the impedance of, of the impedance of the via uh, is smaller, that flat profile will dip a little bit more, right? So, you know, there is kind of like a profile on the S parameters before you get to the dip and the location of the dip that is going to impact dramatically your uh, you know, your, your insertion loss, right? So you definitely don't want to have uh, big stabs, you want, you want the, those stabs to be minimized as much as possible and with back drilling technologies these days, right, you can do that rather easily, right? You want to sometimes remove the pads. The pads by itself without back drilling the via is a big capacitance, you know, to like the first plane and that by itself generates a big uh, capacitive uh, stab that would create a dip uh, at a lower frequency. So just sometimes by removing the part by itself, you can improve dramatically, right, your channel. Right? It will depend on the, the frequency that you're running, right? If you're running a signal at like 100 megahertz, you won't even see, right, the via. The via is not even, it's related to like, the wavelength of the signal that you're sending through the circuit, right? Now, if you're sending a signal that is like 20 picoseconds long, 
now suddenly a 150 mil via right is like you know a, almost like 30 picoseconds of, of, of delay or something right I mean so it's in the order of magnitude of the signal that you are sending right so that is the problem it's not related so much to the length of your channel but rather you know to the frequency content of the signal that you're sending if you can create a via so we, when we look at vias we look at vias you know with stop without a stop if you can create a via without a stop and you can ba basically match the impedance on the via right such the via is transparent right it won't be an issue it just won't be an issue right now it's all degree of grace right i mean depending you know how high of the frequency and how well matched is the impedance, you're going to see an issue. And it's going to be independent case by case. You know, I guess that's the best way that I can answer that question. I used to create a calculator uh, by which, you know, I, I model the via very uh, roughly, right? But there are formulas, there are like closed form solutions, right? Uh, where you can estimate the impedance of the via, right? Uh, but uh, what I would recommend, right, for particularly people here at DesignCon, right, if they are working at the higher giga gigahertz frequencies, right, the best thing that they can do is try to model the vias, and not only like a couple of vias, but many, many vias, to look not only for the vias itself and the impedance of the via, but also the crosstalk to other vias in a 3D field solver, you know. Yeah, so normally, you know, the model is generated uh, different ways, right? but the model is generated for the via by itself or by a, a set of vias, right? And in there you extract these parameters just by looking at the via by itself, you can see like the uh, insertion loss that the via uh, have, right? And then you have to know, right, how to split the via, where to begin and where to end, right? But then it's kind of like a block process. You can concatenate your traces with your vias and you very easy to like remove the via for your circuit or not. And you will see like the deltas, right? Yeah, and understand basically what the via will be uh, impacting in your channel, right? I've used many, many different simulation softwares. I've used CST, I've used ANSYS, I've used uh, HFSS, I've used Symbior, uh, I've used ADS. Uh, you know, I really, you know, we like to, to look at different softwares, compare results one to another, right? To make sure our simulations are, are solid and it's not just a, results from one single tool so measurements right i mean so we have to do measurements every you know simulations uh, in my opinion are a good uh, guidance right but uh, i wouldn't only trust simulations to give me absolute values okay i really need like a measurement uh, staking the ground at some point during the design process to be able to determine if the simulation is accurate or not okay so that's the way I view simulations. I view simulations more like a guidance tool, comparative analysis between two different strategies, right? But not necessarily as like an absolute measure of the results that I uh, would uh, see without having a measurement right next to it. Well, we have like uh, Agilent, uh, Keysight, uh, 50 gig VNAs, right? We have like uh, high frequency scopes. We have like uh, TDRs of different TDRs. brands. We can use the VIA measurements do we using TDRs or using VNAs. I mean, one is the, in, the best fa fast Fourier transform of the other, right? Uh, the only difference is like the noise floor, right, that different instruments have, right? So we tend to use VNAs to do these passive channel characterizations, and we grab the data from the VNA and convert it to the time domain. But there are times where uh, a simple TDR measurements can really help you debug a problem or analyze. Oh, we're full of those <laughs> design guidelines, right? I mean, you can go in here and you can see like all these different roll of thumbs, right? And all these different things that, you know, that people talk and those comes from measurements and from experience. And sometimes, you know, people agree with those roll of thumbs. Sometimes people disagree, you know, sometimes there are little times where the roll of thumbs cannot be really applied. So it's not so much about the roll of thumbs. It's really about like the knowledge to apply those roll of thumbs when they should be applied, right? I mean, so. It's a, a great opportunity for me to really uh, present some of the work that we are doing, but mostly to learn you know, from other people and to invigorate myself and the team uh, to create new work moving forward in terms of research. I would encourage them to basically go to as many presentations as, as they can, right? I would encourage them to be extremely curious, 
and humble, right? And try to learn as much as possible from the expert, right? I mean, I think that's very, very, very important. Uh, and I, that would be my advice to them.